<clears throat> sorry, I've just started the recording. So when Steph comes back in, uh, in a minute, we can then start the broadcast and I'll start it on YouTube as well. Are you letting participants in? They should automatically come in once I hit, so when I hit the broadcast button, yeah. it allows them in. Right, so we probably, yeah, we probably want to start about um, one minute after one o'clock, don't we? Yeah. In terms yeah. of them. Um, have to let everybody get themselves organised. We're very organised, Steph. Look at all those boxes behind you. Oh, yeah, it looks organised. <laughs> Okay. There's a whole row of books there on learning Italian and I'm still not fluent. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn my video off so it's the three of you, but then I'll hit the broadcast and then if you give it 10 seconds or so before you start, Steph. Okay. All right. Hello, and thank you very much for joining us today on this really special webinar. Um, I'm glad you're able to join us through Zoom and hopefully also through YouTube. Um, I'm Steph Ray and I'm a former SIGN president and chair of our strategic policy panel. And it's my great honour to host this conversation today between Jane Davidson and Tony Juniper, two of our illustrious patrons of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. Now the housekeeping part of these meetings is so much simpler now that we do everything remotely, isn't it? And since I'm sure that you all know the locations of your own kettle, bathroom and door, it leaves me simply to tell you that you will be automatically muted unless you're one of our panelists. So if you'd like to ask a question at any point um, during the, the conversation today, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, and Jason and I will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar and try to ask some of your questions at the end. The webinar is being live streamed on YouTube and will be available afterwards on the same website. So please recommend other people to watch it if you think they'd be interested to do so. So now I'd like to just briefly introduce our guests today. Tony Juniper, who I'm sure you're all aware, is an environmental campaigner, writer and advisor. He's previously worked with organisations such as Friends of the Earth, WWF, the Wildlife Trust, and has been a previous Green Party candidate. And then he was appointed Chairman of Natural England in 2019. Tony's a Fellow of the Institute of Environmental Science and of the Society for the Environment. He's a recipient of the Rothschild Medal and the Cromie Award. But above all else, of course, he is a patron of SIME, and we are very grateful to him for joining us today in a personal capacity. Jane Davidson is currently the Pro Vice Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Wales Trinity St David, but she's perhaps better known to most of us as a politician and a passionate environmentalist. The former Assembly Minister for Pontypridd and Minister for the Environment, Sustainability and Housing in the Welsh Government. And in that role, Jane did what, as far as I'm aware, no other Environment Minister has done before or since. She legislated to make sustainable development Wales's central organising principle. And let's just sit with that for a moment and imagine for those of us who aren't Welsh, what it must be like to live in a country where all decision making is filtered through that particular lens. Now that was done through the introduction of primary legislation, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, and in her excellent book, I've got a copy here and I hope you all have too, um, Future <coughs> lessons from a small country. She set out how that legislation came about and how the Welsh Government came to put future generations and hence sustainability um, at the heart of all its decision making. It's an important and timely book um, and I'd now like to hand over to Jane to tell us a little bit story but hopefully in the interesting and political times that we live how we can all learn from it. Jane and Tony, thank you. Thank you, Steph, so much. And I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted um, to join with you and particularly with Tony in this same webinar uh, today. Um, perhaps I should start um, saying a little bit about what the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is, because one thing that became very clear when I was asked by Chelsea Green to write the book 
um, is that actually the knowledge of the legislation outside Wales, well, even within Wales, um, was still, still pretty sketchy. So thank you so much for your commendations about it. But I think that um, for me, the fundamental proposition that I've been trying to promote um, pretty well uh, most of my adult life is the idea that good decisions have to factor in the long term. And that if we don't think towards the long term, we'll increasingly make poorer decisions and more short term decisions. And of course, those poorer short term decisions lead to further poorer and short term decisions. And you all you get into a, this appalling cycle. And in one sense, we've probably seen it um, writ large during the sort of COVID discussions uh, when, in fact, a decision made one day is overturned the next day. And what we all need in the interests of looking after our families now and into the future is to generate a different kind of futures thinking. And that's what the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act does. Many people on this call will be familiar with the idea of the three pillars of uh, environment, society and economy as, the, as three um, almost the sort of embedding principles of sustainable development. But what the uh, Welsh Act does uh, is, act, is really actively also look at the culture because the culture, the heritage, the identity of a country, the culture of an organisation is absolutely critical if you want to create behaviour change. So the Welsh Act is predicated on four pillars or domains. It has seven goals, seven goals that are uh, interrelated. Um, so that, for example, you may be interested in what prosperity looks like as a goal. And uh, one of the things that is so exciting to me is these goals were put into law in Wales through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And prosperity in Wales is in law an innovative, productive and low carbon society which recognises the limits of the global environment and uses resources efficiently and proportionately, including acting on climate change and which develops a skilled and well educated population in an economy which generates wealth and provides employment opportunities, allowing people to take advantage of the wealth generated through securing decent work. Now, apologies in a sense for reading out the whole goal. But I have not yet found another country that has defined prosperity in this way. And because this is now a law, it does mean that individuals, organisations um, can hold both the public services and the Welsh Government to account for not delivering on that. And if I just read you one other, because we're going to focus very much on nature and nature recovery and how nature needs to be right at the heart of everything we do you know, going back to the um, First Earth Summit and humans' right to live in harmony with nature is very much at the heart of recommendations within my book. But a second goal is a resilient Wales. Personally, I prefer this to be called the nature goal, but a nation which maintains and enhances a biodiverse natural environment with healthy functioning ecosystems that support social, economic and ecological resilience and the capacity to adapt to change, for example, climate change. Now, there are five further goals, all of which are interrelated. So health is linked not just to um, sickness, but physical and mental well-being. There's a goal around equality. There's a goal around Wales of cohesive communities, a goal around culture and thriving Welsh language and a globally responsible goal, which requires Wales as a nation when doing anything to improve the economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales takes account of whether doing such a thing may make a positive contribution to global well-being. So, for example, no offshoring climate risk from Wales without potentially facing a challenge. The other thing that's really important about the goal is that it factors in five ways of working. And these are also in the law. So you don't just have the goals, what Wales and the public services are looking to achieve, but you also have the ways of working, the mechanism for delivery of those goals, the mechanism for testing whether or not uh, an organisation's decision making is in the spirit of the Act. And the key factors here 
are that the decisions should be long term. They should be preventative. They should be collaborative with other organisations. They should involve those about whom decisions are being made and they should integrate uh, the thinking around the goals and the objectives of the organisations. Now, the important thing here, of course, is that here we now have an act which has a mechanism for delivery and a set of goals to be delivered. It's not well known yet, even in Wales, but the public services are now, and the Welsh Government, are now trying to shift all their delivery mechanisms toward this. And they are helped both by um, an innovative role of a future generations commissioner, and she, her name is Sophie Howe, and her office, their job is to help the public sector organisations and the Welsh Government, and where appropriate, hold them to account. They're also helped by the change in audit, because public services are audited through normal audit routes, but therefore the auditing, auditing mechanism is having to change because of this. And I think importantly, in the context of uh, this seminar, when I was exploring the journey, the journey ever since I became an assembly member in 1999 and inherited the uh, commitment to the Brundtland definition of sustainable development, development that meets the needs of future gener sorry, current generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, I and other uh, people in the government in Wales were trying to find a way of ensuring that the, that philosophy could be taken throughout everything we did. And it took a long time. I mean, in fact, I left the proposition there as a bombshell for the uh, government between 2011 and 2015 when I left politics. But I'm particularly delighted that actually it wasn't me in government. It was the next generation of people in government. It was the next generation of people in the assembly at that time that decided that Wales did need this le legislation and took all the proposals that we've made previously and turned them into the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Now we're very early on in that agenda, but Steph, you pointed out at the beginning, Wales is actually unique. Despite 193 countries signing up to the Sustainable Development Goals, Wales is the only country that has a legislative mechanism to deliver on them. Despite the Brundtland definition of sustainable development being in place since 1987, Wales is the only country to have enshrined that into law. And what I found in the um, uh, looking at the, at the creation of the book, the 140 contributors, um, looking at how the learning from Wales could perhaps help other countries organisations, corporations, towns, cities, to think about how to do this stuff, because it is still countercultural, even though in a sense you could say the survival of our own species, as well as a number of species that people on the call will care about, absolutely depend on this. And just, there are five key elements that I'd like people to consider as we go into the discussion. Leadership for delivery is key. The legal framework of the Act gives clarity of purpose and a mechanism for delivery, so it provides no excuse for any public service in Wales to fail on delivery on the goals and ways of working. But they won't be able to do that without two critical elements. One is that the Act needs to become a People's Act, the tool by which the public can hold both government and public services to account on behalf of future generations. And I think this is particularly important in restoring faith in politics and building resilience and cohesion of our communities. But the government and public services have to create the right support and financial mechanisms. Because if we don't have those long-term well-being needs at the heart of government policies, then it will not be delivered. Learning from others is always important, but in the context of this particular seminar, it is now of my view that the single most important thing we can do for future generations is to take all the actions needed to restore nature. And that means shifting government budgets and requiring all organisations to play their part to support the recovery of nature and climate. And I think to finish my contribution, I'd just like to tell the story that I tell in the book from Satish Kumar, 
who tells this wonderful story about visiting uh, the LSE and asking its vice chancellor uh, if he could meet the ecology students because he was invited to address economy students. And when he was told there were no ecology uh, students there, he commented that since oikos, now eco, is the word for our planet home, and since logos is the knowledge of our planet home, and nomos is the management of our planet home, how could he be in a university which decided to teach management of a home they had no knowledge of? And that story stuck in my mind, and I think particularly uh, for an organisation focused on creating more and more effective ecologists, we should be thinking ecology before economy. And I hope that that time is now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Claire. That last thought, I, I think, probably is at the nub of uh, most of the challenge we face at the moment in terms of being able to accommodate these huge crises of, of climate change and, and the degradation of ecosystems in the way we live. Uh, it, it, it's through economics and, you know, at the moment we, we still seem to be running on, on two fairly parallel tracks at best, if not diverging tracks with our uh, global obsession with increasing growth really being the principal blockage to being able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero and to repair the natural environment. And it's not to say that these two things are impossible. Uh, probably we can have an economy that uh, would function in the way that we would like at the same time as dealing with these environmental questions, but it's not designed like that right now. And, and the two things, they, they, they are still disastrously separate and you know if i was to put my finger on you know the things that block us from reaching that kind of aspiration set out in the brunkman report and in dozens or indeed hundreds of declarations and commitments since it, it is that failure to integrate major areas of um, human interest with one another and and so that you know that that disintegrated approach I think is, is something that really is uh, an urgent challenge for us to deal with. You know that there's glimpses and glimmers that pennies are beginning to drop and people are beginning to think differently but we've got a lot of work to do there still. Alongside that failure to integrate economy and ecology, uh, uh, you know another thing and this is the burden of what you've written about Jane and what you've done, um, it, it, it is to overcome the human propensity to live in the present you know, whether we like it or not, you know, we humans, we, we have Pleistocene brains, you know, we evolved in um, very different circumstances to the ones we inhabit now. But the momentum of our biology and uh, our past, it, it still runs with us. And, you know, most of us are, are quite concerned about tomorrow rather than 10 years time. And we might have recollections of the past, but we don't live it really, we live in the present. And so being able to encourage people to think about the long term is hard enough. Encouraging entire countries and societies to do it is a considerably bigger challenge still. And I think what you've done with the Future Generations Act in Wales is a great inspiration of how we might bridge that um, particular divide. And then, um, you know, an another um, of those big barriers, I, I, I think, you know, I, I would put four of them there. I've mentioned two. One is the integrating ecology and economy. Another one is, is the need to take the longer view. What, one more, and this is again, I think a human tendency, is the ability, or maybe not a human tendency, maybe a Western society tendency, is the challenge that we sometimes face in taking a collective rather than an individual view. And so, you know, these problems are shared problems. And yet, you know, you have um, countries as a subset of the globe, ploughing their own furrow and, you know, giving uh, the impression that they can't act unless everybody acts. And the same with humans, an individual level, you know, when my neighbours aren't doing it, therefore, you know, what difference can I make? And so creating the frameworks that brings everybody together is another uh, of those, you know, really fundamental sustainability challenges. 
Uh, and then the fourth one I, I would add, and, it, and it's slightly out with the, the conversation you started us with, but I think it's implied by what you've said, it is the inequality challenge and the extent to which, you know, it is very difficult to get major shifts of the kind that are required when various groups in society or indeed countries on the global stage feel as though they're being unfairly treated. And, you know, President Macron, with his laudable attempt to increase the price of fossil fuels for vehicles, for de diesel and petrol, it was met with the most furious backlash by people telling him, you know, uh, you're telling us about the end of the world, tell us about how we can make um, ends meet at the end of the month. Uh, because poor people felt as though they were being disadvantaged uh, for an agenda that they didn't really feel as though they had any ownership of. And so you put all those four things together and you need some pretty fundamental shifts in how we think in order to be able to navigate all of that. And actually, I, I, I'm, I, as I'm speaking, I'm just thinking about like, you know, the extent to which those questions of bridging the short term and the long term, the broad view versus the kind of very specific and siloed view, um, the collective versus the individual and that sense of fairness, where, whether these things are difficult to deal with because of the way the human mind works or whether they're difficult to deal with because of the way Western culture works. And I think it's probably the latter, um, especially having spent time with indigenous communities in the rainforest and the Amazon and elsewhere, they don't think like us. It's really quite remarkable. And the way in which they look at their place in the natural world and in the, in the great order of things, uh, it, it's rather different, strikingly different from how we look at things in the West. And so I, I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking as, as um, I'm reflecting on, on what you did in Wales, is how you know we can use legislation to begin to, to to break some of these very considerable barriers and to be able to move into a different space as as a way in which as 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 a result of the way in which you know the political discussion has to be conducted having passed that law actually you know closer to my own experience is the climate change act of 2008 uh, i led the campaign at friends of the earth um 2005 to 2008 working with colleagues there to get that over the line and we were having very similar conversations to this one about you know taking responsibility now for future generations on the grounds that you know people who are not yet born they're not going to be able to vote and since they can't vote because they're not born we're going to have to take an educated guess as to what kind of a world they might like and that did prevail uh, in creating that framework and that has been similarly transformative here in taking an issue that was up and down in the media, you know, more or less um, flavour of the month, and turning it to something that has to be returned to time and time again against a series of carefully planned carbon budgets. So creating those frameworks, you know, we, we do get glimpses of, of how it's possible, um, but we've got a very long way to go. And I, I, I suppose anybody who's ecologically aware in, in looking at the scale of all of this, both in terms of those challenges I mentioned, but more importantly in terms of the rate at which the greenhouse gases are building up in the atmosphere and the rate at which the mass extinction event is gathering pace, um, one can't help but think that this is now beyond urgent, um, that this is, this is something that, that really can't wait any longer. And so how do you break those big log jams uh, in an emergency. Well, this is the work of Extinction Rebellion, isn't it? And others who've been trying to, to, to really raise the tempo of all of this. Um, but um, we face, you know, all of these distractions at the same time, two of them on the agenda now, COVID and Brexit. And, you know, environment and climate kind of gets glimpses into these issues. Um, but I think, you know, right there is an example of, uh, you know, our propensity to deal with the things immediately at hand rather than the even bigger things that are just over the horizon. Yes, I think I think one of the things that um, um, you, you, were, you were just saying, Tony, made me think about the importance of place in this and taking actions in the context of places so that people see the value of them in, in their own communities. Mm. Um, I think when I when I found out that Wales was the you know, only country in the world that, as it were, had turned um, the sustainable development goals into law. Mm. Initially, I was really surprised because this is part of 
a large international agreement and many international agreements have been created around climate mm -hmm. and everything else and sometimes with with with, with some um, you know, steal with them as, as, as in the original Kyoto, Kyoto Agreement. But it does strike me that mm. if we don't persuade people in the place they live, yeah. that there are, there are other ways of doing this, then, then that, that becomes in itself a, a sort of beacon of hope. Because in so many ways, we are so far past... Um, where we would want to be, particularly if we look at the rate of extinctions and and obviously the Living Planet report is coming out this week and I doubt whether it's going to give us any any good news. Mm. But I think one of the things that the Act has enabled people to do in Wales is that it can focus on individual communities and look at solutions. Mm. So very famously, of course, we've got the solution, the rewilding solution that came from um, Isabella and uh, Tree and, and her husband Charlie at NEP, um, which has gathered huge support as people who initially condemned them as being irresponsible in the contract context of the English countryside are now really interested in, in the biodiversity that's come back in a relatively short time and what was a marginal arable proposition. Well, in Wales, one of our enormous challenges has always been you know, being the being the first major industrial nation. I mean, the first million pound check was was uh, was actually in Wales in the coal exchange, and, and we have in the South Wales valleys we have these communities that have been you know were there for the industry, they've, but they've been left behind post coal and steel. Mm. And one of the most exciting propositions that I highlight in the book um, is a project called Skyline where local communities have worked with others to help them corral their thoughts and what has come out of that is a project where the communities could be given the land around them back mm. in perpetuity provided they they, they deliver future jobs um, and conservation in the spirit of the well-being of future generations act so it would be a contractual legal arrangement mm. and i think those kind of things are incredibly exciting because they can show that different ways will work um, and i think that um the another example which i know that uh, ecologists were particularly happy with when it happened was that was the fact that the having the act gave the first minister of Wales confidence to turn down the proposed for the extension on the M4 that would have cut across the triple SSI in the, uh, in the Gwent levels. So now I think we have to look at what opportunities are there for nature based solutions um, in the context of the next administration, because we have our Welsh general election in in May next year. And the act is framed not as a political act in the sense, and, and it would be completely wrong to be a political act in the sense of favouring one party over another. But because the act demands long-term thinking, because the act demands action that will, that will contribute to tackling climate change, that will contribute to enhancing biodiversity, that changes the nature of prosperity, all, all parties are going to have to come to the table with propositions. And I think what's so exciting about the Act, and of course will also be its big test, is that parties coming to that in the context of saying they might do it differently, but they can all take on the principles in the context of their own ideologies. So what would be the best nature-based solutions? I mean, as Chair of Natural England, you're working on this every day of your life and looking to translate things into legislation. Mm. What would be the best nature-based solutions that we can potentially get behind that then others can look at? Because we've never ever met our Convention on Biodiversity targets, mm. um, but can we be really innovative? in the same way as we were 40 years ago in the context of bringing back the red kite, for example, which was an all UK conservation success and are in my woods. <laughs> um, so so, so the, the question, Jane, if, I, if I've understood it, so you, where, where are the priority areas mm. for nature-based solutions in Wales? Um, so, well, a, a, a few kind of headings come to mind. So, so the first one is peatlands. So the British Isles has quite a lot of peat. Peat is a 
very significant global source of ecosystem carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And the more we degrade peatlands, the, the worse those emissions become. By reversing the degradation of peatlands and beginning to stop them emitting carbon and then to start reabsorbing it through creating active peat surfaces, uh, surfaces, not only do we do something on the carbon equation, but we reduce flood risk and we clean up rivers, uh, which then improves the profitability of water companies and is a benefit to tourism and for sport fishing. And so, you know, a focus on peat is, is one place we could immediately go. Uh, another would be the restoration of the temperate rainforests that one, once went across the mountains of Wales, uh, you know, including in mosaics of, of, um, of areas where, where there used to be trees on peat and there aren't any more and it's all been cleared away mostly to make way for, for extensive uh, grazing agriculture. Can we put some of that back again with a carbon benefit, potentially with a considerable tourism benefit? And, you know, all of these things of an improved natural environment in the, uh, you know, rural areas can be of enormous benefit to people in the urban areas in terms of health and well-being. And so you can start to piece together um, how, you know, nature-based solutions, they're not only solutions for nature, they're solutions for the economy. And I think this is really where, you know, we, we have to firm up the narrative and create confidence for politicians that they can actually adopt policies that will enable them to you know, not have to make these trade-offs, but to do genuinely joined up delivery. I'll tell you one thing, and actually I fed this in um, to uh, uh, Welsh um, policy discussions when I was working at WWF, and hopefully with some good effect. Uh, it was this, this was the idea of environmental growth. And so, you know, for, for, for some green thinkers, you think, well, you know, growth, environment, they don't really go together, do they? But actually, if you think about it for a nanosecond, they really do. And I got this idea from um, Cornwall and the local nature partnership down there a few years where they had managed to convince the, the, the Cornish um, regional uh, authorities that environmental growth should become an organising principle for, for the regions, for the county's development. And the idea goes like this. If you look at the major tourism, sorry, the major sectors of, of the Cornish economy, including tourism, fishing and farming, all three of them rely on the environment. So people wouldn't go to Cornwall if it was horrible. They go there because it's nice and it's beautiful and it's green. People catch fish there because the sea is still healthy and the ecosystem still works. And agriculture depends on a stable climate, stable rainfall, pollinating insects and good soils. So if you grow all of those things, then you grow those economic sectors. And so, you know, you invest in the health of the ocean, you invest in the health of soils, you invest in the beauty of the landscape, because all of those things make economic sense. And I think, you know, the same very much applies in Wales. And, I, you know, conversations we had with, with Welsh government a couple of years ago when, when I was with WWF, you know, I, I think we did find um, that there was a real interest in, in coming with these integrated approaches where we have economy and ecology coming very close together to the point where, you know, it's not one or the other anymore, it's both and, and by doing both, you get more than you would from either on its own, if you see what I mean. And so that for me, I think is the big challenge now and nature-based solutions sits right in the heart of this. I know that some environmentalists, you know, they really don't like the idea of natural capital and ecosystem services and defining and framing nature as something which is, um, you know, primarily a human endeavor and looking after nature because it's good for people. But the thing I say in return to them, it's not either or, it's both and. Nature is still intrinsically beautiful. And of course it's got its own reasons to exist irrespective of what people think. But the chances of that occurring without giving people some sense of why they wanna do it for their own reasons, you know, we're not gonna win, we, we will fail. And so, you know, the, the, this kind of mix of narrative ideas that blends in economy and ecology just seems to me at the moment to be the most important thing that we have to do, especially as we're entering into what looks like a pretty deep economic crisis. And, you know, the reaction to that has previously been, including after the financial crisis in 29 and uh, 2010, uh, you know, what you do often if you're a logical policymaker, you say, well, we can't afford the environment now. It's too expensive. Green regulation will hold the economy back. We've got to go hell for leather for economic growth and environmental issues get deprioritized and we cannot afford 
to let that happen now. And so the nature-based solutions piece for me is really vital in being able to go into that space to show that we can create jobs, we can have economic upsides, but we do it through restoring nature rather than thinking that it's continued degradation as the price of progress. Because if you carry on down that road, then progress ends completely eventually uh, when the biosphere bites back. And um, you know, we're, we're um, getting to a point where we can see some of that already feeding in. This year's grain harvest, for example. Yeah, no, I think I think we'll gee, picking up on 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 that theme of the grain harvest. I think one of the really interesting aspects at the moment is for the first time um, we're really starting to talk about food in yeah. the context of my political life. I mean, we may have had a you know because obviously during the war there was very much a ministry for for for, for food mm. and food element of DEFRA. Um, uh, for many years lost importance because of the fact that food was relatively easy um, to acquire. But now there are potential political challenges um, in the context of whatever may happen via Brexit, as well as climate challenges in what's happening, as you say, to the grain harvest. And suddenly food is on the agenda and with it, hopefully a major opportunity in nature-based solutions. I mean, I was delighted to be asked to um, chair the Wales Inquiry of the uh, Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. Um, and they've issued a report for each um, country, each nation inside the uh, United Kingdom. So there are some elements that are completely joined up and other elements that will be in country. Um, but overarching, there is a, an agri-ecological approach and I think this is potentially very exciting because um, times of change are also times of opportunity. So it's a question of how can we use that time of change to, in our case in Wales, deliver on enhancing biodiversity, delivering on low carbon prosperity, creating new kinds of food opportunities. I mean, Wales only grows 3% of its fruit and vegetables. Mm. Now, I know we're only a small population. I know we're only a small country and we've got a lot of hills, um, but we have a lot of south facing slopes as well. So there are all sorts of ways in which, you know, we can, we can apply new kinds of thinking. And I think the point that you've also made about applying, we, we almost apply um, uh, our, our present thinking to the future rather than thinking about the future and applying that to the present. It's we, we need to reframe this discussion because if we apply our present thinking to the future, then we potentially use modeling that might've been created 20, 30 years ago in terms of what the future is going to look like. Whereas actually there are lots of elements that are unknowable, but so far the science around climate has very much kept pace with the modeling and the predictions so the political thinking around the futures, the management thinking around the futures, the economic thinking about the futures has yet to catch up. So there's a sort of notion for me about, well, if we have a nature based solutions approach, which absolutely fits with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, then for me, there's also this big question about why don't other organizations, governments, countries, places, cities, particularly those interested in um, reacting appropriately in the context of the climate challenge, why are they not also putting the future of their grandchildren in the widest possible yeah. sense? Because we know that all that we know that's going to go wrong, potentially, yeah. is actually going to be in those children's lifetimes children who are born yeah. now yeah. so the action urgency is now yes and, and so the, you know the answer as to why governments countries and, and institutions don't do that i just repeat my four points earlier those very broad and deep-rooted challenges that it's very hard for for people to get past and you know it's kind of compounded by by you know, the fact that, you know, the future is an uncertain place. And, you know, you, you were there, Jane, along with myself and many others. Um, for years, we were battling against people who said climate change wasn't even happening. They had, they had a contested, different, fundamentally, diametrically opposed view to what the future actually would hold. 
and they came up with their data in inverted commas i use that word and other you know evidence also in inverted commas to you know prove that the future wasn't going to be a warming world and so we're battling against that skepticism because the future is contested you know nobody has a a particular view of it and the other thing that i've noticed about this is really important to bear in mind i think in terms of the tone of voice that environmentalists use is the extent to which sometimes you know we ignore at our peril uh, the extent to which people who take a different view similarly believe they are working with a moral purpose and with an ethical perspective and so some of the people who want to create more jobs and grow the economy in order to improve well-being of people even though that may be high carbon and therefore for us we think morally is incorrect they still think morally that reducing poverty and giving people a better life is morally uh, acceptable and so you know sometimes what we finish up with is the environmentalists arguing for some morally kind of defensible future in a way that comes across to other people who feel equally motivated by an ethical purpose as though you know the, the high ground is being taken from them and that's when i think you know you get a real clash of values and then people properly digging their heels in and it turns into something of an ideological ideological discussion or it can do so um, I've, I've seen bits of that as we've been going along too and so you know the um you know the, the 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 way in which we talk about the future probably is quite important too and, and recognizing that you know not everybody agrees um what it's going to look like you know quite a lot of people they just put their blind faith in technology you get this quite a lot in in various places you know we're just going to throw the kitchen sink at technology well what technology to what end um and yet you know i'm sure you and i would agree that probably quite a lot can be done with technology and part of uh, what we have to do probably is to find ways in which we can create more of a consensus about a desirable future actually maybe that's what it comes down to when we spoke earlier jane I, I just reflected on some of the things i see in my role as chair of natural england and one of the um big challenges at the moment is this polarization that exists on on most subjects that that we you know are active in you know trying to find solutions diametrically opposed views with people taking very different um, perspectives and you know the, 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 those those hardened positions make it very hard to make progress and like you know when everyone's in their trenches probably the place where the most interesting things are going to happen is in no man's land where we can like you know maybe find some common ground where people can work together and, and I think that's not only about the current issues and all the things that we're wrestling with but it's about the future too so um yeah i suppose by a very long-winded way of answering your question about you know why is it so hard i think you know what i'm adding to the list there is the extent to which not everybody agrees about what the future is likely to be like never mind what it should be like and and so that gives us you know quite quite a challenge and then that's about conversation consensus building building bridges finding ways for people to be able to have you know good discussions um rather than endless bitter arguments that you know really are only appealing in the echo chambers of either side without making much progress anywhere i think i mean i i absolutely agree with you in the sense that um there there, there are times in my life as both a um you know a minister and 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 uh, after that in university where i stopped talking about climate change yeah. um because you could you'd, you'd look at the people you were talking to and you could almost see some people switch on and the and other people switch off but actually what's been really interesting um since the launch of this book um has been that actually talking around future generations is a less contested area yeah it might be a reframing that is that is that is, that is useful i mean when i was speaking about um, the book in the US, I had somebody come back to me who was a, a young Republican who felt that they could ask me to come and talk um, uh, about um, future generations in a way that he could never have asked me to talk about climate change. Yeah, well, so I do, and I think that, I think that the, this language issue is really important. I mean, I said when I introduced the goals that I thought that the resilience goal in Wales should actually be called a nature goal. And I think that's even more important, um, you know, post the introduction of COVID into our lives, because we know that nature has been so important 
in uh, people's mental health in the context of restrictions on their on their movement mm. and actually you know there is there a moment when you know people's support for nature may well be greater than it's ever been because the importance of that in just uh, in just keeping ourselves together at the very least or providing opportunities to engage in a in a very productive way i mean i'm somebody who um you know we we have land we grow as many of our own um crops as possible we keep a small amount of livestock we're we're a traditional 1970s self-sufficiency although we prefer the idea that we are, are in a community of people who are um living life on the land but i mean that that's part of what keeps me sane because there's that interrelationship and that understanding that it, you can't let these things go. There has to be continued interaction. And I think that continued interaction in terms of engaging, as you're saying, across a whole range of people, trying to find consensus, trying to find new audiences. I mean, I'm talking to all sorts of people as a result of this book who I've never talked to before. And for those listening, I mean, there's 140 contributors to the book, you know, from different countries, from all ages, from different backgrounds. And that is part of the strength of finding this huge consensus of people from a range of backgrounds and ages and environments, some from developing countries, others from developed countries, who would like to see their leaders take future generations into account. So I think that and that thinking will lead us to nature-based solutions, will lead us into looking after uh, future generations. So perhaps we can see if, um, if, uh, if any of the people on, on the, in the audience uh, would like to engage with us on this. Thanks, Jane. Uh, yes, please do keep adding questions to um, the chat or to the Q&A box. Um, so many topics really there, Jane and Tony, to, to, to talk about. Um, to go back to where we started and, and Wales, why do you think it is only Wales? Is the fact of Wales as a small country where people are perhaps closer to government, is that important or, or what is it? Why is this not really taking root anywhere else? Well, I think, I think that the ideas are taking root elsewhere. Um, and actually, at the moment, John Bird, um, Lord John Bird, he of big issue fame, um, and Caroline Lucas are together with the support of an all party parliamentary group on future generations, trying to take the Welsh legislation and uh, propose the introduction of it as a U piece of UK legislation. Um, uh, with some changes to reflect the um, authority of the devolved nations. Um, and we know that actually there are other countries in the world that are particularly looking at well-being economics at the moment, which is very much in the same spirit as the well-being of future generations and looking at changing budgets. I mean, Iceland, New Zealand, uh, Canada, Scotland are, are among the, the pioneers in that kind of work. We know that there are the... 40 climate cities across the world, uh, the 40 mayors um, getting together. So there are lots of initiatives. We know of the work of um, Kate Rayworth and Donut Economics and what they're trying to do in Amsterdam to make it the first donut city. So there's lots of individual initiatives. Um, but I think that the, the sort of wake up call for me as a, as a previously as a politician was that countries sign engagements with each other to deliver and I'm sure they mean it when they're signing it but we all need mechanisms to help us deliver and part of the lessons of the small country is that actually because it's a small population and a small government then then what has happened is there's been huge engagement between government and its population and every year that engagement has said that people like the idea of Wales being a sustainable nation. Whenever the population have been asked or engaged in contributing, they have supported generally, obviously not all of them, but generally that agenda. So it has been developed in that sort of hiccupy way in which our ideas get developed. You know, it goes a long way up one day, it drops down another um, and has taken 
10 years into the consideration before it, it, before it then went through its legislative process. But that learning is useful to others. It's useful to others in an organization. It's use, useful to others in the political sphere because it also demonstrates the huge challenge of changing the culture of the body of people who are required to deliver on what they see as their main job. Yeah. And really, my fundamental proposition is the main job needs to be looking after the interests of the future generations through the obligations on delivering on current uh, reg um, regulations and legislation. And in a sense, it's that point about saying, instead of being in a situation of present future, so we apply the thinking of the present to the future, mm -hmm. we need to be future present. We need to apply thinking about delivery in the future to the present. And Roman Kushnarik in, in his book, The Good Ancestor, um, uh, describes a, a great mechanism that I'm, I'm, I'm now finding more about, a Japanese planning mechanism, where effectively a citizen's assembly type model, half of its members are asked to imagine that they are living in 2060 and they are much more innovative and radical than those who see themselves as living in 2020. So I think that, you know, all governments at the very least should be doing a lot of work about not just what the contested future might look like, but how governments should manage what those contested futures could look like. Yeah. Because that feels to me a very important plan B, if plan A, i.e. technology will answer all the problems, uh, does not work. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, it's been, yeah, it would be interesting, I think, to see what the response would be if we did that same piece of, of market research, if you like, in England, as to what people's understanding of, of a sustainable future might look like and how brought in the general population was to it. Um, and in many countries around the world, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've, we've, you've talked, Tony, about, um, about sort of the polarization of views on some of this and, and um, how you know, we need to take account of, um, of, of the fact that other people may hold very, very honestly and, 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 and sort of in, in their view, uh, morally held views that are, that are opposite to those of, of some environmentalists. Yeah. Um, we, we think a lot in, in SAIM about the, the skills that will be needed for the next generation of ecologists and environmental managers. It's really what, what should we be thinking about in terms of communications and, and making arguments that are widely understood by more of the population rather than, you know, yeah. talking in our own echo chambers. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the skill set for, for, you know, future environmentalists who, who are going to do the kinds of things that, that Jane has been talking about. Um, you know, a lot of this agenda has been driven by science for quite a long time. So, you know, ecologists, climatologists, atmospheric physicists, and, you know, they, 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 they've brought the world's attention uh, to these subjects. And, you know, I think it's going to require, however, rather different skill sets now to be able to move this into a place of doing what's needed and you know you mentioned communications that is essential being able to get the 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 the, the well the framing right and the information behind the framing to be able to meet as many people in as appealing a way as possible uh, that, that, that that sounds quite simple but it's not and um you know th there's a real skill set embedded in there the other thing alongside communications is um empathy and having an empathetic approach towards building partnerships with people who need to be on the same journey you know if, if i can over characterize it at the moment you know environmentalism there's been a load of campaigners battling away to get people to to see their point of view and you know i remember some of the language we used at friends of the earth you know 25 years ago it was about forcing change and like you know pushing and shoving and getting stuff done and you know a quarter of a century ago, that was probably right in terms of where we were at with very low awareness, not much acceptance. But now we've moved into a phase where, you know, there, there is a pretty strong, in this country at least, you know, consensus across the political parties at least, and in the public there's 
quite a lot of awareness. And so the skill now is, is not to bludgeon open a discussion. The question now is about how do we bring people together to agree on a way forward that they can all see a role in for themselves. And that, that is extremely tricky, especially if you've been steeped in environmentalism for a long time, because everything you do then feels like a compromise because it's not what you know that you know should be happening with a capital S. It's what can happen with a small C. And uh, it's, it's quite an uncomfortable place for quite a lot of people. Um, but I do think that, you know, these are the kinds of things um, that are going to be needed it, it is, you know, communications, raising awareness, getting people together, building partnerships, finding common cause. And, you know, if we've got the frameworks of the legislation, Jane, that you've been behind, it's going to make it all the more possible that we're actually going to get somewhere. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, it's like the Climate Change Act here. You know, it was a first step. It's not a solution on its own. It opens the door for a process and then the process has to be run, you know, over, over many decades by definition. And uh, hopefully we get progress and, you know, the progress will come. Um, yeah, from, from those kinds of softer and more kind of um, subjective ways of getting change, actually. Um, yeah. I think, yes, I think, I think that's really, really important, Steph, because um, I've framed the book, as you know, um, in, through uh, the words of Professor Donella Meadows, um, who was just an extraordinary sustainability-focused systems thinker who, who sadly is, has, has, has died now. What interested me about Donella was that back in the 1970s, when she wrote the book Limits to Growth, um, she uh, thought that science and facts were enough, that people would act if they were given the right science. And well, when I say the right science, it sounds like a value judgment, but if they were given accurate science and accurate facts, that that would be enough. When she visited that concept again in the year 2000, or it was actually 2002, um, when she wrote Limits to Growth, the 30 year update, she accepted it was absolutely not enough. And she'd thrown up the idea in her first book that there were other factors that needed to be considered. And she called them um, visioning, networking, truth telling, learning and loving. In her second book, she said those were much more important than the science and the facts. And I, and I think it took me yeah. um, a long time to understand that. And I think most of the time I was a minister, I was very much operating on the basis of here are the facts, here are the evidence. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it? <laughs> uh, but now I'm very much into Donella's idea that, you know, of loving, which is that you have to win the debate with enough people. Yeah. You have to have the space for the debate that is safe. You have to uh, uh, work with people on things that they also want to see happen. And in a sense, there need to be many of us doing that in our own different ways all of the time if we want this moment to turn into a movement because time is against us and species loss is against us and uh, politics at the moment feels in many ways against us but in itself will provide a set of new opportunities and we have to offer the vision of hope and one thing that I would say to people who are you know skeptical about the idea of this kind of framework is that when I look at all the things that have happened this summer, when I've looked at the fires, when, I, when, I, when I've I looked at the melting of the Arctic, when I've looked at the tunnels appearing in glaciers in the Antarctic, when I've looked at the Black Lives Matters debate, when I've looked at um, all those other issues around climate, when I've looked at COVID, actually the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is a framework that allows you to deal with all of them. Yeah. And it would be hard to find potentially another country that has a framework they can bring to bear on those challenges. But they're all challenges that are challenging the wicked issues of our time, issues around equity, issues around equality, issues around climate, issues around deforestation and what that does to release viruses, etc. So, you know, in a sense, we have, if we don't stop our actions that are making these things worse, they cannot get better. But instead of just ceasing on actions, 
maybe we need to be active in creating the new actions that can contribute to a better future for us all and for future generations. Thank you. I'm conscious that we're very short on time, but I would like to ask you one question that's come through here, uh, just for a very quick thought, both of you, on Extinction Rebellion's Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill, in terms of um, how we think that um, legislation is a way forward. I'm, I'm supporting it, and I'm supporting the, the Wellbeing of Future Generations uh, bill in uh, both of them private members bill yes. both of them I hope will be picked up by government because that would have to happen for them to become law indeed thank you James Tony have you got a comment you'd like to make well I, I, I've not I've not read it um, in, in terms of what what their what their what the law would say so I, I can't really comment on, on on that specific thing but I would say that uh, you know history shows us that you know we have to have legislative frameworks to deal with these things and we've got the Climate yes. Change Act and we've got some targets coming through with the Environment Bill, which are in a similar vein in some ways. And so we have some of it there. I don't know what Extinction Rebellion are asking for beyond that, although I would guess more urgency uh, and, and maybe a, a greater pace of, of change. Um, but irrespective of, of the details, yes, you know, the, the frameworks have to be there. Not least because, you know, this, this baton of change has to be carried between successive administrations. You know, no one government's going to fix this. The whole point of Jane's yeah. uh, Future Generations Act is, you know, that, that we need to be in this in a consistent way for the long haul. And so anything that does that is going to help. And if I may finish with one quote from John Rawls, do unto future generations what you would have had past generations do mm. unto you. Yeah. Good. <laughs> a good way to end, I think. It is. Thank you. Thank you. it is an excellent way to end. Thank you both very much for joining us this lunchtime. That's been fascinating and left us, I think, with, with some hope of things to do and the way to move things forward. So thank you again for coming. Thanks to everyone who joined us on Zoom or on YouTube. And um, we'll speak to you all soon. Thank you. thank you. See you soon, everybody. Bye, Jane. Bye, Steph. Bye.